When we consider the performance of an algorithm, we have two basic concerns of efficiency, how much space in memory ends up getting used, and how much time is taken to complete the job. The obvious way to measure performance, then, is to monitor memory usage and also get out a stopwatch, see how long it takes to perform any particular algorithm. But doing these things, particularly the latter, is not generally useful. The same algorithm run on different systems, or run at different times on the same system, or runs on the same algorithm with different input data, in all these cases, you could end up with very different numbers. So empirical measurements are first of all difficult to do, and secondly, of dubious utility. In the formal analysis of algorithm running time, what we concern ourselves with is not an algorithm's running time on the clock, but rather its so-called time complexity, which is a characterization as a function of how the running time changes, how it grows, as the input size operated upon by the algorithm grows. So, for example, with a sorting algorithm, the question is how much more work must it do to sort a list of a thousand items compared to sorting a list of a hundred items? How much more work must be done as the set of input data gets larger and larger? What's called big O notation, as in a capital O, is a notation in which we take the time complexity function and reduce it to a simpler function. Or, put more accurately and mathematically, Big O notation describes what's called the limiting behavior of a function as the argument to the function, in this case the input data size, tends towards a particular value or infinity. In this case we're concerned about infinity. To put it another way, Big O notation characterizes a function by its growth rate. The idea, as you'll see, is that certain factors aren't really relevant because in the long run, as the input data set gets larger and larger and larger, those factors just don't have much influence on the general shape of the curve. So consider first of all the time complexity function for the linear search algorithm. And actually there's not just one time complexity function, there are three. There's a function expressing how much work must be done in the best case, in the case taking the least amount of work. There's a function for the worst case, the case that will take the most amount of work. And then there's the function that characterizes the average case. Well if n is the length of the list we are searching through, in the best case the element we're searching for is the very first item, so all that gets done is just one unit of work. In this best case, our loop only has to iterate once. In the worst case, the value that we're looking for is at the very end of the list, in which case we end up having to iterate through the entire list. So the time complexity function of the worst case is n. And then in the average case, the element we're looking for is in the middle. So the average case is 1 half n. I should note here that usually in this analysis we consider only comparisons to be a unit of work. For the sake of this analysis, when you look at the statements of the code, you just ignore every other statement. All we're concerned with are the comparisons. This simplification tends to work out well because for every branch and for every loop there's one comparison, and it's the branching and looping within an algorithm that primarily influences how much work gets done as the data input size grows. In any case, now we have the time complexity functions for the best case, worst case, and average case, but how do these functions end up getting reduced in big O notation? Well, for our best case, which consists of just the constant 1, this remains unchanged in big O notation. Likewise, with the worst case, n is simply remains n. In the average case, however, the factor with n is considered irrelevant, because while 1 half n is a slower rate of growth than n, for the sake of broadly characterizing the function by its rate of growth, it's considered extraneous information, so we just reduce it to O n. What we really care about with big O notation is which of these curves does the rate of growth of our algorithm most resemble. In the very best case, our algorithm doesn't take any more work to perform as the input gets larger and larger. In other words, it's a constant time algorithm, denoted as O1. And understand that the big O notation is always O1, and not O2 or O3 or O4 or O5. If our algorithm always takes, say, five comparisons to perform no matter what the input size, we reduce that to O1. Because in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about five steps to perform an algorithm or one. All we care about here is the rate of growth. And whether an algorithm always takes a thousand steps to perform no matter the input, or just one step to perform no matter the size of the input, those rates of growth are the same. So we denote them both as O1. Of the rates of growth shown here, the worst one by far is n factorial. The curve of the factorial function grows extremely rapidly, so an algorithm with a time complexity of O n factorial won't do well with large sets of data. As the data set gets large, 
the amount of work which the algorithm must do explodes, likely making the algorithm impractical to use on large or even moderately sized sets of input data. So n factorial is definitely not desirable, and n squared is pretty bad as well. n log n and n are generally pretty reasonable, and then best of all, aside from O1, is O log n, which very nicely decelerates its growth as n gets larger and larger. So it would be clear that despite how it may look in this diagram, the log n curve does keep going up and up and up as n gets larger, it just it levels off to a very, very gradual curve. So a question is, in which kind of algorithms can we expect to get log n? Well, the general answer is an algorithm in which with each step, with each iteration, we cut down the set of work. And recall, this is precisely what the binary search does. With each iteration of binary search, we are removing from consideration uh, a whole half of the remaining data set. So whereas the best case for binary search is again one, a constant time search, because it may happen that we, uh, just there in the middle is the value we're looking for, but then in the worst case, the time complexity function works out to be, for reasons I won't uh, detail, uh, log base 2n plus 1, and in the average case, log base 2n minus 1. Expressed in big O notation, 1 becomes simply O1, uh, log n plus 1 becomes simply log n, because the plus 1 is not really going to change the shape of the curve, it's just going to move it up slightly. And also note that we generally leave out the base 2 part of log n because that's just understood. And lastly, in the average case, log base 2 n minus 1 again becomes O log n. We just drop the minus 1 because again, that just slightly shifts the curve without really changing the shape of the curve. So formally we can see here, at least in terms of time complexity, binary search is a very efficient algorithm. Though I must say that in practice, when binary search is executed on real hardware, the way binary search jumps around the list isn't very conducive to performance on today's CPUs that are very reliant upon caches. Because if you recall from an earlier unit, the way the CPU cache tends to work is that when you access uh, an address in memory, a chunk of the surrounding addresses are brought along with it automatically into the cache. Because the general presumption of the CPU is that when we access address, we are very likely to then want to access stuff that is near that address. Binary search uh, thwarts that expectation. So actually in practice, especially when it comes to searching through smaller lists, binary search may actually be less efficient than, ju than just a simple linear search, because linear search will likely trigger fewer cache misses. Lastly, looking again at the five sorting algorithms we considered, here are their time complexities expressed in big O notation for the best average and worst cases. And note that quicksort and merge sort both have in-place variants. In the case of quicksort, we're considering the in-place version, and in the case of merge sort, this is the not in-place version. The clear winners here are quicksort and merge sort, because n log n is a shallower function than n squared. n squared is a steeper rate of growth. And while insertion sort and bubble sort have a best case of n, those are just the best cases, and best cases are generally not considered typical. Mainly what we're concerned with are average cases and worst cases. Those are generally far more important. As to whether quicksort or merge sort is preferable, well, merge sort seems to have the advantage in that its worst case is still n log n rather than n squared. But in practice, quicksort in the best and average cases tends to execute faster than merge sort. So quicksort actually is probably the most commonly used. The main disadvantage of merge sort is that its operation requires more memory. And finally, while bubble sort is never really used in practice, a selection sort and insertion sort, despite having bad growth characteristics, are actually quite efficient on at least smaller lists. So they are sometimes used when the amount of data to sort is known to be small.